Okay, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. This is Vanessa Metz. I'm with the Coastal Commission's Water Quality Program in the North Coast Office. And we also have Mike Sandecki with the, uh, in the Santa Cruz Office with the Water Quality Program. And let's see, uh, can we go through quickly who's on the phone again, please? Mandy Ravel from Long Beach. Liliana Roman from Long Beach. Anastasia Aziz from Pacific Grove. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you for calling in. We'll go ahead and get started then. Um, today's webinar workshop is on the Coastal Commission's model LCP water quality guidance that the Coastal Commission uh, Water Quality Program staff has been developing over a few years now. The agenda for the workshop is uh, briefly that we're going to go over the Coastal Commission's Water Quality Authority, do a quick overview of our guidance document, talk a little bit about the low impact development focus of our guidance, go quickly through the model implementation plan recommendations, and talk a little bit about the relationship of this guidance document to um, the regional boards and state boards, stormwater permits, and other regulations. There are numerous Coastal Act um, policies that are relevant to polluted runoff and runoff control. In particular, Section 30231 specifically addresses controlling runoff and also says to maintain and, where feasible, restore water quality. In addition, the Coastal Commission is partners with the State Water Board on the state's non-point source program, which implements the Coastal Non-Point Source Program on a statewide basis. And this meets both Clean Water Act and Coastal Zone Act Reauthorization Act um, requirements. So what is this model LCP guidance? Well, it's intended to um, help with LCP and long-range development plan updates and new LCPs as well. It includes both model LUP policies and IP standards. And these are examples. We're not saying that this is required components. And we expect that these examples will be adapted to um, reflect local needs. Oh, we have a couple of people that just showed up in person. Greetings. <laughs> we just now got started. And the uh, audience for this guidance is intended to be both the local government staff for developing their LCPs and also Coastal Commission analysts for analyzing proposed LCPs that come in the door. We came up with these recommendations um, using a synthesis of a lot of different resources, including the state um, municipal stormwater permits, the MS4 permits, both the phase one and phase two. We looked at, uh, we started with five recently approved LCPs and gleaned out the um, strengths and weaknesses of these. We looked at a variety of low impact development manuals, both within the state and from other states. And uh, we looked at some of the other uh, state regulations, construction stormwater permits, the CASCA stormwater BMP handbooks. And also we um, relied upon our experience in analyzing water quality elements of a lot of recent um, coastal development permits. So in this model implementation plan, we have it organized by three water quality plans. The first is the construction phase plan, which we call the construction pollution prevention plan. And also for post-development, we have two tiers. One is what we call the post-development runoff plan, which is for all developments. And then for developments that have a higher um, threat of water quality impacts, we have uh, another tier, which is what we call the water quality and hydrology plan. And for all of these plans, they um, we're calling it a plan because it's a, a group of information. It doesn't necessarily have to be a standalone plan. It can be incorporated in the application materials, but for ease of referring to the requirements and the content, we're calling it a plan. 
And for each of these plans, the amount of detail that is expected for the plan is commensurate with the type and scale of the development. So for a, a large uh, retail outlet with a huge parking lot, we'd expect a lot more detail than a small single family residence addition. So we're looking at this as a framework, an easy to use framework for organizing um, LCP water quality elements because as you're probably aware, they're often quite scattered throughout the document. And so this gives a way of, of pulling them all together and looking at them in a group. <clears throat> the organization of our model IP is, um, first of all, we have an index that um, refers to row numbers so that you can quickly find the right place in the document that you're looking for. Have a quick overview of the uh, three water quality plans. We also have a section for the project site information that would be needed in the application in order to fully evaluate the water quality impacts. And then for each of the three plans, we have sections for the applicability, when, when you need that kind of plan, submittal requirements um, prior to um, the permit issuance, et cetera, and performance standards, which is what we're going to be focusing on today, and as well, content, the kind of information that you would need in order to show that you've met those performance standards. So for throughout our model water quality guidance, we have the, these three simple principles, is to protect and restore water quality where feasible by both minimizing pollutants and runoff, and also by minimizing changes in the runoff flow regime, including the volume flow rate, timing, and duration of flows, and not just the peak rate. It's, uh, many studies have found that the conventional type of stormwater management where you're just cutting off the peak flow rate really was not protective of coastal water resources. <clears throat> and you probably don't need this for this audience, but um, we also were doing this for some of the coastal analysts who weren't as familiar with why we need to address runoff flows. And so there's a variety of potential impacts for these increased um, runoff flows and changes in the runoff regime. Our guidance is organized around the principles of low impact development, um, which has um, two main components. Uh, the goal is to replicate the site's pre-development hydrology through both doing preventive site design strategies, such as minimizing the building footprint, and then also small-scale distributed best management practices, which use um, infiltration, evapotranspiration, harvesting, and detention or retention of runoff. And it's important to make sure that the preventive site design strategies are included because um, I've seen in a lot of permit applicants um, where they come in with uh, LID BMP that's kind of stuck on at the end. Oh, okay, runoff. We have to deal with runoff. Okay, we'll do permeable pavement, and they're not taking into account the whole site design to try to minimize the generation of runoff in the first place. So that's a, a very important um, component. So for the LID site design strategies, they follow these principles. Um, and our guidance document is organized with examples of these, such as minimizing impervious surfaces, disconnecting those impervious surfaces from the storm drain system, enhancing on-site infiltration, protecting natural hydrologic features, uh, waterways, uh, topographical depressions, and such, and preserving the um, non-invasive um, um, and preferably native vegetation as well. So for uh, the portions of the uh, runoff that you're not able to reduce with site design strategies, some examples of LID BMPs to mitigate the, those increases in runoff include uh, bioretention systems, swales or rain gardens, directing the rooftop runoff into the landscaping, permeable pavement systems with underground water storage and infiltration. Um, harvesting the runoff with a rain barrel and planting trees and other vegetation to enhance um, the uptake of water by the plants. So for the construction pollution prevention plan, 
we talk about um, best management practices that we recommend for erosion and sediment control, but it's also important to um, address other types of construction pollutants. Um, we have a section for additional best management practices that we recommend for projects that are constructed either in water or near or over water, um, and also uh, to try to avoid a, a removal of vegetation that's um, unnecessary and to avoid unnecessary land disturbance and soil compaction because the soil compaction can really uh, reduce your infiltration capability. For the post-development runoff plan, our uh, strategies are to address runoff early in the site design process, and that's very crucial. We often see uh, runoff added on to the end of the project, and it, it's hard to integrate it well at that point. And as I said, to give precedence to low-impact development in all development, not just the developments that are of higher water quality concern. And if Infiltration isn't feasible or practicable, say a bluff top parcel where there's a, a threat to the bluff stability, to incorporate alternative BMPs that can function to slow runoff, maybe retain it and harvest it, or um, have additional evapotranspiration without the infiltration part. In addition, it's important to have source control BMPs in all development, to including you know, single-family residences to keep pollutants out of stormwater runoff. And it's also very important for all development to manage these BMPs for the life of the development. In addition, the post-development runoff plan has um, a few things that are, that are new um, in this uh, guidance document compared to some of our older LCPs that we've um, we've approved, and that uh, one of those is the uh, emphasis on low impact development. Um, our previous LCPs have used most of the components of low impact development, but they haven't been drawn together under the umbrella of this term, but uh, since LID is such a um, recognized and um, accepted approach to stormwater management these days, we're actually using the term and using it as sort of an organizing principle for this guidance. In addition, um, trying to minimize dry weather runoff wherever possible, and to minimize the impacts of stormwater outfalls, such as in this photo here, um, the impacts to coastal waters, and also to uh, minimize the impacts to environmentally sensitive habitat areas from runoff. And there's one additional um, new recommendation that we have, and that is um, what portion of the runoff from the site that you address in your runoff management plan. So all new or replaced impervious surface, the runoff should be addressed from, um, from those surfaces. But in addition, um, we're recommending that if the new and or replaced impervious surfaces exceed 50% of the pre-existing impervious area, then you should really consider it as a whole new project where you address the runoff from the entire developed area. So for example, if you have one acre of pre-existing impervious surface, and you add 0.6 acres of new impervious surface, you should just go ahead and address the runoff from the whole site. Okay, now we're on to the second tier of uh, post-development plans, which is for developments of water quality concern. And Mike Sendecki is going to take over at this point. Okay, I just want to make it clear that uh, all the points that uh, Vanessa has addressed up, up to now um, should be applied to all development. And um, so that there really isn't uh, uh, any threshold um, that um, is exempted from that. We, we think that those, all those um, principles should apply to all types of development. You want to speak can, closer to the phone? Oh, you have one down there. Okay. I have one down here, yeah. Okay. Uh, can every, I hope everybody can hear me. If they can't, just um, you know, let us know. Uh, um, this is this. Can I ask one question, or do we save? This is Anastasia from Pacific Grove. Do we save until the end? Could you please save until the end? Yeah, that would be, okay. That would be great. Um, and we'll give you a lot of time to ask questions at the end. Thanks. Um, so I just wanted to make it clear again, you know, that uh, the PDRP requirements apply to all types of development, uh, as uh, development is defined under the Coastal Act. So if you have an application for a coastal development permit, 
we'd like to um, see all those things addressed where appropriate. And again, uh, Vanessa stressed that um, it's uh, commensurate with the type of development that's done, which one of these things, which, which of these things will apply. Um, but with the developments of water quality concern, um, we're looking at elevated potential for impacts. So it's an additional layer of water quality protection planning that we like to we um, feel is appropriate. And those projects are identified because they're very proximal to coastal waters. They have a type of land use that is um, known for um, having a lot of pollutants on the site. And uh, finally, uh, the amount of impervious surface that's involved, because the more impervious surface uh, that a development has, the more potential impacts for water quality that it may have. So we have an, uh, an additional tier of requirements that we call a water quality and hydrology plan. And the main differences here are that we want to see that a qualified professional has prepared the documentation. And that usually means that there's an engineer's stamp or a registered geologist stamp um, or one of the water board's um, uh, licensing provisions on there. Um, we want to see that the site is characterized for pollutants and the amount of runoff that will be generated. And that uh, when you do design BMPs and uh, infiltration areas that you use numerical design standards. And also that LID is um, the primary um, means of retaining uh, stormwater on the site uh, wherever it's feasible to do that. And the reason we're really pushing for LID is that it's especially um, relevant to uh, the types of permits that come through for development under the Coastal Act. Uh, we're really dealing with a site-by-site -site, um, type of development. So we're, we're kind of limited to what can be done on that specific site. And we can't really apply it to an entire watershed program. So uh, LID is very appropriate because it takes each site and um, does whatever it can to make sure that that site retains its hydrologic character. Uh, that means that if it infiltrated water, it will continue to infiltrate water. If it infiltrates and treats uh, any pollutants on the site, it'll, it will continue to do that. And that's really the beauty of uh, LID, and that's why we're, we're really emphasizing its use. So with site characterization, uh, the first thing you look at is what type of pollutants might be uh, generated on a site. And this is just a parking lot stain from dripping automobiles. Uh, you might see hydrocarbons. Um, if you're looking really closely, you can also see that there's um, some birds that are nesting above the site, and you can see, you know, some some stains from that. Uh, every site's different. Um, a lot of these um, types of pollutants are pretty easily uh, uh, filtered out by using LID. So, with the site characterization that we expect to see in the water quality and hydrology plan, uh, we want you to look at what types of uh, pollutants are expected to be generated on the site, and then we'll be able to deal with those. Uh, and then drainage management areas are a way of calculating the runoff uh, from the site. So the site's broken up into uh, areas that have different character uh, for runoff. And it's basically the runoff equals uh, a runoff coefficient times the rainfall and times the area of the site. And so that's calculated for each uh, drainage management area that have those different characteristics. Um, and this is where the numeric standards come in. For the um, intensity of rainfall, uh, when you're using a numerical design sizing, you can either have what they call volume-based um, BMPs or you can have flow-based BMPs or a flow-based design. Uh, what's normally called the water quality volume or the water quality flow. Now the difference is that with LID, um, the first um, 
the first attempt you make is to try to infiltrate the water quality volume on the site. And usually infiltrating water, uh, stormwater runoff with some pollutants through soils and vegetation is adequate to treat those. So that's what we'd like to see, and that's usually the LID approach. Flow-based is used where infiltration is not really an option, and that might be because might be because the site soils are just not uh, capable of infiltration. But also um, flow-based might be used because there's a geologic hazard. If the site's a bluff top site um, that is questionably stable or marginally stable, then you might have to use flow-based BMPs to treat the runoff and then uh, move it off the site as opposed to infiltrating. Now, if you can't uh, infiltrate runoff, uh, LID asks you to do other things other than infiltrate. And those are really simple things, but they're not always possible to do. Uh, examples of these might be like uh, putting flow into rain barrels and using it later on for irrigation, or evaporating it off the site, or planting more vegetation to simply you know, try to evapotranspire more, uh, more of the of the runoff. So um, flow-based and volume-based are kind of different things, but we always try to retain the volume of runoff on the site uh, under LID practices. The 85th percentile standard is what we usually shoot for, for uh, either water quality flow or water quality volume. Um, the 85th percentile standard is based on uh, 85 out of 100 storms are that size or smaller. Um, only 15% are, are bigger storms than that, so there's more flow. Um, but the reason we shoot for the 85th percentile uh, in order uh, to treat that is because the small storms mobilize most pollutants, and the larger storms, by the time you start getting that much rainfall, uh, most of those pollutants have already been mobilized and moved off-site, so the, the water is relatively clean. There's also an economy of scale in treating the lower flow volumes. Uh, in other words, uh, you would have to have a really big BMP to treat those larger volumes uh, anyway. So there's some economy of scale there, uh, and 85th percentile is um, what's, what's been recognized as a pretty efficient uh, uh, volume to tree. Um, but the design standard that you actually use for your site, um, it doesn't have to be the 85th percentile. In fact, many of you on the Central Coast uh, see that the Water Board is asking for 95th percentile standards, which uh, treats even uh, larger storms than the 85th, which has been the standard for a lot of the area in the state. And the reason for this is because they found that there, if they, you go out and look at the sites, um, that they're actually in a natural state. They would be uh, infiltrating about 95th percentile of the, um, of the storms. So it really depends on your site and what the site conditions are. Uh, if you, um, the, the larger uh, percentile standard you use, the more volume you're dealing with but it's also um, a, a larger margin of safety um, for keeping pollutants on site and for not uh, changing the hydrology of the runoff that uh, leaves the site. Treatment control BMPs are used uh, where you can't just get uh, infiltration uh, into the ground. Um, and the difference is that um, infiltration, uh, like a uh, permeable pavement usually infiltrates the amount of rainfall that actually falls on that pavement. A treatment control BMP um, receives water from a concentrated source like a rooftop or a parking lot, something that, um, that the runoff is kind of concentrated. It's not just the rainfall onto the site. And the treatment control BMPs uh, are twofold. They have two um, two purposes. One is to filter the pollutants, and uh, it also they also have a capacity to either infiltrate or detain for a while. Um, infiltrate would be retaining runoff, 
whereas detaining runoff would keep be keeping it there for a while and um, metering it out. So treatment control BMPs can be set up to do both. Uh, as an example, in Santa Barbara, uh, for this Q equals CIA formula, they use a rainfall intensity of 1.09 inches in a 24, I'm sorry, that's for um, flow through BMPs, 1.09 inches per uh, 24 hours is for the volume-based BMPs. I said that wrong twice. <laughs> so um, that would be for infiltration BMPs, um, volume-based BMPs. For flow-through BMPs, they use a rate of 0 0.2 inches per hour. So if you're looking at this um, swale, rock line swale here, um, if it was a volume-based BMP, it would have to infiltrate one inch in that 24-hour period um, over the whole rooftop. So whatever area the rooftop is, one inch times that area, uh, we have to infiltrate into that BMP. Uh, if it were a designed as a flow-through BMP, then it would have to flow and it have to retain so that it would keep that 0 0.2 inches per hour flow within that BMP and then it would flow out the end. Um, and the thing about BMPs like this is there can be a combination where they actually do some infiltration but maybe don't infiltrate the entire 24-hour flow volume. So here's some more uh, BMPs. On the left you have what we call earthen-based BMPs and these are bio strips or bio swales. Uh, there's a cross section below. You can actually um, augment the soils. Uh, if you have uh, soils that don't infiltrate very well naturally, you can take those natural soils and augment them to keep the uh, flow on site more efficiently or more of it. Um, the whole, of, and these are what they call uh, LID BMPs. On the right, you have um, a whole different set of uh, types of BMPs um, that are treatment BMPs. And these are what they call proprietary BMPs, and they're designed by a company um, as media filters. Um, the one on the top is a media filter, and it simply filters out flow at a certain rate and is efficient enough to take the pollutants out of it. So they are, um, there are numerical standards that are used to design these things. And below you have what they call hydrodynamic separators. And it uses a vortex to separate out the sediment and um, other pollutants that stick to the sediment. So both of these things require quite a bit of maintenance. Uh, in other words, those filters need to be changed, or in the case of the vortex separator, it needs to be uh, vacuumed out periodically. Um, but they're very useful where there's not a lot of rooms to put in an earthen-based uh, BMP. So some sites, you know, really need to have these types of devices. But they are not considered to be LID, so they're not the first choice in, in most of these um, water quality plants. Uh, some of this um, doesn't really show, but it's just a, uh, the idea is that uh, some of these uh, types of treatments are considered LID and some of them aren't. Uh, most of them are volume-based and some of them are flow-based. And the preference is for LID that is volume-based because that means uh, you're probably infiltrating most of that flow. Another one of the uh, requirements for the hydrology plan, the, the for um, developments of water quality concern is that an alternatives analysis is done uh, to modify the site design if you can't retain the water quality volume on site using LID. And basically um, what it's asking for is to go back to the original site design and see if something can't be changed so that you can use LID uh, to retain that water quality volume on site. Um, usually what happens is that you find that you can retain some of the water quality volume on site, but part of it you can't. So you would also um, look at that and, 
and make sure that you're maximizing what you can stay keep on site. And uh, finally, uh, if you can't keep that water quality volume on site, or if it's close, or if you need to, you know, be looking at that more closely, uh, runoff controls need to be considered. Um, and we only ask for that if you're adding more than 15,000 square feet of impervious surface. 15,000 square feet sounds like a lot, but it's only about 122 by 122 foot square. So um, it's it's not a whole lot. It's the size of a you know parking lot or a tennis court or something like that. Um, but we really don't ask for runoff controls unless you're adding that much impervious surface. Um, and you would consider either using water quality retention on site or peak management to address that. And I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. So um, we talked about earlier that there's two reasons uh, for treatment BMP. One is to treat the runoff, and the other is to retain the runoff to try to keep the hydrology the same and the hydrograph the same. And this is just an illustration of pre- and post-development. And it's showing you that you have a uh, kind of a peak that's a lot larger. Um, so you get more runoff arriving faster when you have that impervious surface. So what you're dealing with with these runoff controls is to make sure that that peak is not much different than the pre-development peak. So the flow retention, which is the first phase of runoff controls for the smaller, smaller of the sites, uh, the 15,000 square feet, uh, you're simply looking to retain that 85th percentile volume, which is the same really as, as the goals of everything before, but it is actually introducing a numeric standard for retaining that volume on the site. And if you can't do that, again, for reasons because you can't infiltrate or you don't have the, the room to do that and you're using one of these proprietary devices, you need to look at peak management. And what you're doing is you're looking at the smaller storms, the two-year through the 10-year storm peaks, and trying to um, match those to the pre-development storm peaks. And usually you're using that by, you're doing that by um, creating some sort of uh, basin or, uh, or cistern or um, some type of, of retention feature. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, why we're um, suggesting that these are incorporated in LCPs. And everybody knows there's a lot of regulatory requirements for water quality. One that um, a lot of municipalities spend a lot of time with is the phase one and phase two stormwater permits. Um, industrial permits, construction permits, they're all um, required by water boards under certain situations. And I'll talk more about that in, in a few slides. Uh, there's state and local requirements, there's federal requirements, there's the California Environmental Quality Act uh, that, as you look at a project and requires mitigation for uh, different impacts that, um, that might be um, anticipated. Um, and by the way, the Coastal Act is kind of a parallel to the Environmental Quality Act. And we actually use the uh, Coastal Development Permit as a parallel to that Environmental Quality Act review. Uh, you have the TMDL program, which is to decide uh, how much pollutant um, can come from what areas because there's a water body that's been recognized as being impaired. Uh, Section 401 is um, regulated by the regional boards, and 401 has to do with um, if, uh, impacts to waters of the U.S. And there's Endangered Species Act requirements that also implicate water quality concerns. So there's all these regulatory requirements out there already. So one of the big um, requirements is the stormwater permit from the water board. 
this is a map showing the southern half of the state. Uh, in green are the phase one permits, which are for very populated areas of the state. Um, and in purple is the phase two permits that have come on in, in, more recently. And both of these have a lot of requirements for these areas that are uh, outlined here. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of the coast that is not covered by these municipal permits. And a lot of that coastline can have development that requires a local coastal permit um, from the Coastal, coastal Commission or from the um, local lead agency. Um, the northern half of the state is similar. Um, there is a lot of coverage for MS4 uh, within the more populated areas. And you can see up in the northern part of the state, the Sonoma coastline does not have um, any jurisdictions with MS4s. Um, but I might note that, it, that there is a, is a separate MS4 permit that's issued to the Department of Transportation. So that 101 corridor or Highway 1 corridor will have an MS4 permit specifically for Caltrans. But if Highway 1 go, goes past an area of Blufftop that has Blufftop residences developed on it, those Blufftop residences don't fall under that permit. So what I'm saying here is that there's a lot of the coastline that comes, comes under CDP that is not covered under MS4. And what our guidance does is it imposes a lot of those MS4 requirements on an individual site basis onto development that would occur in, the, in these areas that aren't covered. Um, and as I just said, Caltrans has a separate MS4. And there's also construction requirements that apply to all areas um, within the, the coastline and within the coastal zone. Um, but the construction requirements, um, they're called stormwater pollution prevention plans um, that are required for construction. They're only required if you have more than an acre disturbed. So a smaller site, like a single family residence that disturbs less than an area, would not have to have any type of construction requirements under the stormwater permits that are issued by the water boards. And that's another thing that our LCP guidance does. It includes um, construction requirements even though you're disturbing less than an acre. And um, it also applies to um, uh, building docks, uh, um, bulkheads, uh, areas in marinas, um, and what have you. Um, I, it, is fair, it is fair to say that if you do have a stormwater pollution prevention plan, there are some post-construction requirements in there, but they don't look anything like the ones in the municipal MS force. They're much, much more. Um, uh, it's it's they're much less specific in what they require. So, um, just to try to anticipate questions, why would you put water quality requirements directly in your LCP as this guidance might help you do? Uh, number one, it provides the standard of review when you're looking at a CDP. It also provides a standard of review when uh, a development permit is appealed to the Coastal Commission. So they have something to reference. If it's in um, another agency's standards, it's not really a standard of review for the local coastal permit. So that's the number one reason why it's important to have this type of information in the, in the um, local coastal plan or uh, what's the other one? That's a long range development plan? Or in the long range development plan for like a, a college campus. Um, and again, it addresses rural areas in the coastal zone that don't have an MS4. 
and uh, they also include more coastal specific water quality requirements, uh, especially when you're looking at construction. So the bottom line is um, for coastal development, um, we think that the resources are um, valuable and the Coastal Act asks that water quality um, be addressed in those plans um, and uh, we feel that applying standards that are most protective of coastal resources uh, is, is the most appropriate thing to do when you're in the coastal zone. So I hope we touched on everything um, that you're thinking about, but um, we're open for questions.